Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we are so excited to have you all here with us for our first event. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Tasha heron Bruff, our Senior Vice President for Community Engagement. Tasha. Hello and welcome everyone. We are so excited that you're all are here with us today. I am also thrilled about our community connection experience that will happen later, so make sure that you stick around. The Dallas Regional Chamber is thrilled to be hosting this event today that would not be possible without our gracious sponsors. Our presenting sponsor is Access, Wells Fargo, our gold sponsor, and our silver sponsors, Microsoft, Southwest Airlines, and Simmons Bank, and our incredible lounge sponsors, the TD Jakes Foundation. Thank you all for your commitment to the DRC, to making the Dallas region the best place for all people to live, work, and do business. Now I'd like to turn it over to our 2021 DRC board chair, Michelle Vopney, for a few opening remarks. Michelle? Hi, everybody. Um, it's Michelle Vopney, as Latasha said, and um, I'm so thrilled to be here today. I am the Dallas Office Managing Partner at EY, and I also have the pleasure of serving as the DRC 2021 Board Chair and the Co-Chair of the DEI Council. I'm so proud to be here, and I'm excited to share and learn with all of you. First, I want to start by telling you about a very important project happening right now at the DRC. And the DRC is having what we call the Take Care of Business Vaccine Campaign, which began with an idea and now has morphed into something truly exciting. In the midst of the pandemic, we all recognize that we have the responsibility to help our community get back to life as quickly as possible. And our board approved a plan to engage in a COVID-19 public awareness campaign we had the assistance of Boston Consulting Group um, to get us started by dedicating one of their key staff members to the project for several weeks. Thank you, BCG. And we also selected Edelman and JBJ Management as our communications partners to help us with this campaign. Our efforts focus on communities of color, which is directly related to our DEI work. These are communities where people have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. For example, Hispanic Texans make up 40% of the population of Texas, but account for 52% of reported COVID-19 cases and just 33% of vaccinations to date. Black Texans make up 12% of the population, but account for 15% of the reported COVID-19 cases in only 8% of vaccinations. On launch date two weeks ago, our campaign reached millions of people through newspaper and broadcast coverage in North Texas and beyond. And you'll start to notice all billboard, our billboards around town, hear our message on the radio and see an incredibly moving PSA on TV. The first time I saw it, I'm not gonna lie, I really got choked up. On June 29th, we'll take the next big step in this campaign when the DRC will host a press release and announce the details of a sweepstakes and prizes that we're offering as incentives for people to get vaccinated. Um, so starting June 9th through August 13th, residents of Dallas, Callan, Denton, and Tarrant counties who get vaccinated can enter into a drawing from some pretty fabulous prizes donated by our members and community partners including American Airlines, Southwest Airlines, the Dallas Cowboys, the Dallas Mavericks, the Dallas Stars, the FC Dallas and the Texas Rangers, along with Dallas Wings. The prizes range from prime seats for sporting events to free round trip airline tickets. And for more information for the sweepstakes, please go to www.takecareofbusiness.org. As Dale says, getting the vaccine is not only about protecting you, it's about protecting employees of every North Texas business so they can fully reopen and get back to life they deserve. Now, I'd like to reflect on all of the work we've done this past year. 
So about a year ago, when the call for justice and equality reached a fever pitch, not only in Dallas, but around the nation, and I think the globe, we called a special board meeting and devoted the entire meeting to talking about the issue of racial equity in policing and how we, the DRC, and the business community should respond. That meeting led to the formation of a board council focused on three areas. First, diversity and leadership. That would include diversity in boards and in the suite C-suite, sorry. And in other words, like um, the people that have a seat at the table when decisions are made. The second focus is education and workforce. And um, anyone who knows DRC knows that we already do a lot of work in this area because we want everyone to have a chance of a good education, a good job, and a good life. So we're just going to make sure that education and workforce lit has a nice DEI lens on it and that we continue to make great progress. And then third, we want to focus on community in investment in underserved areas. We need to lift up communities that don't have living wage jobs, internet access, transportation, childcare, access to grocery stores. So we took all of those ideas to the board and we were told that's a good start, but look, we need to add one more category because it is so important to racial equity, and that is policing and criminal justice policies. So we added this fourth area of focus, um, and it's about building trust between the community and the police. In assembling the DEI Council, we purposely organized it with the DRC chair and the incoming chair as always serving on co chair as co-chairs of the DEI Council. So we will always know that it is the high priority for the board and the leadership of the DRC board. And when we asked for volunteers, more than 50 board members raised their hands and said they wanted to serve. An amazing and passionate response. I was delighted and so inspired. The change needed to be woven into the fabric of what we do at the DRC. So last summer, we were putting the finishing touches on our strategic plan, which runs from now into 2023. And we brought the final draft before the board and it showed our three main pillars, economic development, education and workforce and public policy with a quality of life theme running through all three of those. But when the board saw that strategic plan, they said, hold on, DEI has to be its own pillar. It has to be a fourth pillar or we're not gonna accomplish what it is we wanna accomplish in this area. And so let's also add the words quality of life for our all people in the ribbon running through all now four pillars. And so we did, and we didn't stop there. We also decided it was important to do something permanent at the staff level for DRC. And we hired our fabulous Senior Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, to help us look through the DEI lens every day in everything we do. And that was Jared, who you just met at the beginning and we'll hear from later. And in the hiring process, we also decided, look, if we're gonna make a difference in those communities that are really impacted and need our help and engagement, we also need a senior leader for community engagement. So we hired Senior Vice President um, Tasha Heron Bruff as our community leader. We expanded the team um, more recently to include a manager of DE DEI, Anna Krista Robles, um, and she is also wonderful. And so with this full-time team and the DEI work that needs to get done, we really feel like we're on the right track but we also needed businesses to invest. And so not only did our board give their time um, to make this happen, but they also stepped up financially. So when we asked for help, the Dallas Mavs raised their hand and generously invested $300,000. So $100,000 a year for three years to help DRC focus on DEI. In addition, Hilti North America and Jacobs Engineering also contributed 50000 each. Their support ensured that we got off to a strong start. And while the work is far from being done, I'm proud of the progress we've made and the decisions we've made to date. 
Today's event is a result of the seeds that were sown a year ago. And while this is our first state of DEI, it certainly will not be our last. All these efforts were started last year under the leadership of John Alajade when he served as our 2020 chair. And so it seems very appropriate to introduce John, our great friend and the CEO of Access and today's presenting sponsor. John, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Michelle, for your incredible leadership. Um, we're so blessed that you're leading our community at this time. Thank you so much. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Access is proud to be the presenting sponsor of this inaugural state of, of DEI. And just so you know, um, being a, a part of this event fills me with so much pride because as, as Michelle has shared with you already, I remember when this was just an idea one year ago. We all know after the killing of George Floyd, uh, May last year, I shared with our DRC board how George Floyd's death had personally affected me and how I was committed to convening the community to pursue lasting change. And I am so proud that our board members felt the same way. And with the support of um, 100 business leaders in this community, the DRC made a public commitment in the Dallas Morning News to address systemic racism head on. And as I've said, I'm very, very proud of the business leadership in this community. And I know, uh, I, I keep talking to friends, there's no other community um, in the country where something like this is happening. You know, and that commitment still stands today. You know, the last year brought forth many challenges that none of us could have imagined. But one of the many positives that came from a difficult year was a strengthening of the Dallas business community as we worked together to demonstrate how business is a force for good. I'd like to share some examples of how we're being more intentional in especially communities that need help. And Michelle touched on some of this already. As 2020 was ending, we decided to make contributions to about a dozen charities in Southern Dallas to support their economic development efforts in especially historically underserved areas. In total, we contributed about $250,000 and it was just a, a start, really, in building trust in the communities where we work and letting them know that we're serious, that we mean business, and that we're here to stay, that we're here for the long haul. Another example is that last year, the DRC partnered with the Dallas Citizens Council, United Way of Metropolitan Dallas, and Boston Consulting Group to launch a racial equity coalition. This coalition has done research on racial inequities across education, economics, health, housing, um, and transportation, and also um, justice and government. Most importantly, though, this coalition has identified more than 75 levers that the private sector can use to advance racial equity within their organizations, along with key equity metrics to track progress. As Michelle mentioned already, it was the board's passion for DEI that made these actions happen. And of course, we'll ensure that we will not let this opportunity to impact change fade away. So you know, Michelle is very, very passionate about this. She reminds us all the time that we have to make sure we're committed to this work for the long haul. And I am so very proud of her leadership. We've accomplished so much and we're still gaining momentum. Um, as we do this work together. And that's why I am excited today to introduce a renowned speaker and leader with the globally recognized Brookings Institution to talk to us today as we advance this work together. Amy Liu is joining us today. She's the Vice President and Director of the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program. She's a national expert on cities and metropolitan areas. And Amy translates research insights into action on the ground and excels at linking local experiences to federal policy making. This is, she's an expert in this area. As a director of the Brookings Metro organization, which she co-founded, by the way, in 1996, she pioneered the program's signature approach to state and local engagements, how to strengthen communities and make them stronger. She uses rigorous research to inform strategies for economic growth, inclusive growth, and opportunity for all members of a community. 
Amy joins us today to discuss her report, From Commitment to Actions, How CEOs Can Advance Racial Equity in Their Regional Economies. The report offers CEOs a three-part framework for action to make meaningful progress toward a more equitable economy starting in their home regions. As you know, leaders in our region are really passionate about this. So we're excited to have Amy really come help advance the work that we're doing. Following Amy's talk, we will have an open question and answer session where you can engage with her. And as we do that, um, please use this uh, amazing chat function that we have as part of this platform at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions during the Q&A session. After that, we will have a panel discussion moderated by our Senior Vice President of Community Engagement, uh, a leader that I am so very proud of, that's a part of the DRC now, Tasha Herrenbroff. We'll also hear from Kelly Henley, the Vice President of Community Relationships for Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is an incredible organization, I believe, deeply in this work and is making major investments to make our community stronger. And we'll also hear from Isaac Elizondo, the Regional Vice President for Microlending at Lyft Fund, to discuss a real example of how they've partnered to drive equity. So a success story, really. The last portion of our event will be an interactive community connections experience. This is a, an opportunity for businesses and community partners to meet each other, engage, and strategize to advance equity in the Dallas region. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Amy Liu. We're so grateful, Amy, to have you with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Hello, it's a real pleasure to be joining you today. I really want to start by applauding the Dallas Regional Chamber and its Board of Directors for creating a Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. It's an important reflection of your values and your leadership in this moment. The purpose of my talk is to provide additional ideas to all of you as CEOs committed to this region on what more you can do to drive meaningful change towards greater racial equity and a more inclusive economy. And let me start by acknowledging that it has been one year since the murder of George Floyd. And during that time, corporations in the private sector have certainly stepped up to support racial justice causes and more recently stand up for voting rights and fair access to our participatory democracy. These visible commitments and stances have been matched by public demand. In fact, a poll conducted last year by Just Capital, which is a nonprofit dedicated to shareholder capitalism, they found that 75% of Americans, including consumers and employees, want corporations to condemn racism and racial injustice. And 61% go further and believe that corporate commitments do ring hollow if they are not backed up by real actions. And that is honestly the concern today, that all of these highly visible announcements this past year have not yielded deeper systemic reforms that impact the lives of real people and real places. And in fact, a McKinsey released a report at the end of 2020 about corporate commitments to racial equity. And in a review of the thousand largest uh, company, US companies, they found that one third did make public statements in support of racial justice, yet a smaller share, 22%, turned those public statements into external commitments like donations and investments but yet even a smaller slice, 18%, made changes internally, such as board composition, staffing, and product development. In other words, we actually need more authentic changes in corporate practices, not just more philanthropy. And while corporate giving is certainly helpful, it is insufficient. And that's because most Black Americans do not want to be treated as charity. As my colleague Andre Perry often says, you cannot nonprofit your way out of poverty and economic injustice. Instead, what most Black Americans want are good jobs and a fair shot at economic mobility, just like everybody else. And that is the quote you see here on the left, which is a report of Black Futures Lab, an organization led by Alicia Garza, which is one of the founders of Black Lives Matters. Their survey of 30,000 Black respondents found that the number one issue among those polled more pressing than the presence of police brutality is that black workers' wages are simply too low to support their families. 
And the prevalence of low wages is not a result of low education. Um, in fact, as the chart on the right shows, Black and Hispanic head of households who do have a college degree have dramatically less net wealth than those of white households. So when Black and Hispanic uh, students and workers play by the same economic rules, uh, when they exhibit, quote, personal responsibility, they are not rewarded. Something else is at play. And that something else is a larger system of marginalization or discrimination in the marketplace. So what can CEOs and private sector leaders do to improve economic mobility and wealth creation for black and brown communities? A few months ago, Renaya Dinkins and I released a paper based on a number of requests that we were receiving from local CEOs about what they can do in this moment. The paper is entitled, From Commitments to Action, How CEOs Can Advance Racial Equity in Their Home Regional Economies. So in that paper, we propose three sets of actions that CEOs can take. You can adopt internal corporate changes. You can act as a coalition of CEOs around a set of shared quantifiable goals and actions. And three, as board members of civic organizations, you can influence these civic organizations like the chamber to do more. So let's start with internal business changes. So obviously you've heard a lot about the importance of conducting an internal audit of diversity, equity, inclusion in your own company bottom line and performance. This is one offered by a good friend named Ronnie Sampson, who is the founder of Opportunity Hub, which is a tech incubator and skills provider in Atlanta. I really like Rodney's six part audit, which he has used in working with startups, scale ups and large tech firms so that DEI shows up in the business culture on day one and every day. In short, the values of DEI ought to be operationalized in one, corporate boards and governance, two, among hiring, promotion and HR practices, three, in corporate procurement and vendor services, four, in corporate innovation and product development so that firms are developing products and solutions that meet the needs of a much more diverse customer base, fourth, in, uh, for, um, in going to market in that firms are placing going to market resources to reach more diverse audiences, and lastly, community impact in the way firms invest in and empower Black and Hispanic communities through partnerships and philanthropy. And so if you follow those areas of action, there are two good examples I want to point out. Um, one is uh, One America, which is a good illustration of how a corporation can take action in their home region. One America is a major financial services firm headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana. In response to a Brookings report that found only 26% of jobs in central Indy are actually considered good or promising and that they pay a family sustaining wage and are full time, the CEO of One America decided it was time for him to step in and improve the wages and promotion ladders in his company for their lowest paid workers. He raised it to $18 an hour or $34,000 a year. IU Health, the state's largest employer, did the same thing. And what these employers wanted to do was make sure that they were not complicit in enabling a low quality economy for area residents. This one is a good example of DEI in product development. The Root is headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. It is a car insurance company powered entirely by mobile technology with a mission to disrupt the industry by trading rates based primarily on driving behaviors, not demographics. What happened was last August, after the murder of George Floyd, the CEO of Root announced that he was going to eliminate the use of credit scores in its pricing model to eliminate the inherent bias that comes with credit scores that disproportionately penalize a lot of groups due to lack of access to fair lending uh, and also happens to have no bearing on driving quality. In short, the root changed its core product and services to what the CEO called fighting bias and systemic inequality in auto insurance and therefore better serve its customers. So those are good examples of changes in corporate practices to promote DEI. And I think that's really important to have credibility to do something bigger. Now imagine what you could do as a coalition of CEOs. And we argue that it's really hard to change the structure of opportunity for large numbers of workers and families by yourself as an individual company or through ad hoc disconnected actions. In fact, what we think is more important is what if a group of CEOs 
committed to changing regional KPIs in partnership with public and nonprofit sector partners that could then meaningfully shift how things are done in their companies, in civic strategies, and in policies that then together can create the kind of change at scale towards the racially inclusive economy. So to start, I was asked to remind everyone in the Dallas region how you currently perform on inclusive growth as a backdrop to thinking about these KPIs. At Brookings Metro, we define inclusive growth as needing to achieve three components. Obviously, you need to have an expanding economy. That's growth. But that growth has to come from increasing the productivity of existing workers in industries, not from business attraction. That is pro prosperity. But that growth and prosperity has to result in better wages and opportunities for workers, including closing disparities by race and place. That's inclusion. And based on our Metro annual Metro Monitor, the most recent one, what we found is that the Dallas region indeed has been growing in the last 10 years leading up to the pandemic, ranking 11th among the 53 largest metros that have over a million people in their population. That growth is certainly is currently producing modest prosperity, yet it is not very racially inclusive, uh, meaning that the growth is ranking the region 30th out of 53 metros on this score, mostly because the gap in earnings between white workers and workers of color are actually continuing to widen. Now, most concerning is that the disparities between neighborhoods um, by income has widened dramatically. What's happening is that the income gap between the highest earning neighborhoods and the bottom earning neighborhoods have widened by nearly $9,000, ranking the Dallas region 46th out of the 53 largest metros in the level of geographic exclusion. And as Raj Chetty and other scholars like my colleague Raj, uh, Andre Perry have noted, where you live matters and where you live impacts economic mobility and the wealth and equity you can accumulate in your home and therefore wealth creation. And since this data runs up to 2019, my guess is a lot of this, um, uh, because of the pandemic recession, a lot of these trends with unemployment, small business closures and others may have made these trends worse. So what can you do? One of the things that we believe that Dallas area CEOs could do in this moment is to work together to set regional goals, including quantifiable targets and an action plan to move the needle towards a more dynamic, inclusive economy. And you can consider goals around talent, around supplier diversity, and around community wealth. For example, on talent, CEOs in Greater Dallas could commit to increasing the share of Black and Hispanic workers in management or computer science occupations. This would ensure that diverse viewpoints are at the center of major business strategy or operational decisions, and that diverse talent is employed in the growing jobs in the post-COVID digital economy. And so what you see here are two sets of bars. On the left is management occupations. On the right is computer math occupations. And what you see in bold is that, the, is that African American workers make up 16.7% of the total labor force in Dallas region and Hispanics make up about 27%. However, Black and Hispanics are highly underrepresented in managed positions in the greater Dallas economy. And they are disproportionately underrepresented in high demand computer science positions, many of which do not co require college degrees but they do require some specific technical training in data analytics, computer programming, or even IT support services. So one goal that you all could set is, how to, is to increase the share of Black and Hispanic workers in both of these occupations to match their overall representation in the workplace. And this is exactly something that the Metro Milwaukee Chamber has done to make their community what they believe to be a region of choice. Employers and business executives in that market have agreed to work together to increase the employment rate of Black and Hispanic Latino workers by 15% by 2025. And within that, they want to increase the share of Black and Hispanic Latino managers in the region by 25%, starting with revising their own internal employment and recruitment practices. Another option is that the region CEOs could also commit to expand expand supplier diversity, which is absolutely abysmal nationally. In fact, one national report we found found that only 3% of Fortune 500 procurement actually benefited Black businesses. 
So one way to tackle this is to increase the share of black owned enterprises in your region. This chart shows again that while African Americans make up 16.7% of the workforce and the population, they are owners of less than 3% of all firms. And so in Birmingham, what they did was more than 10 CEOs joined with the mayor in a commitment to supplier diversity as a way to support the growth of existing black owned businesses and then to improve the overall ecosystem in which more minority owned firms can start and flourish. This group of leaders were similarly concerned, like you may be here in Dallas, about the low number of black owned businesses in a region where blacks make up 28% of the region's population. So they launched something called VITAL, which stands for Valuing Inclusion to Accelerate Lift. And what it includes is a private sector commitment to collect and make transparent their procurement data, which is the first step in awareness and tracking and reforms to vendor relationships. And as you can see here, the business coalition includes the publisher of the business journal, the CEO of Shift, which is a Birmingham based startup brought up, bought, recently bought by Target, and the CEO of, Al CEO of Altec, which is a global manufacturing firm and a member of the business roundtable. So, it, and the third option in terms of regional metrics is that CEOs could come together to promote community wealth in key neighborhoods. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the income gap between the highest and lowest earning neighborhoods of the region have widened by $9,000 or 11%. And as you can see, that's happening because primarily because the wealthiest neighborhoods are getting wealthier while households and other neighborhoods experience very, very modest income gains. So what CEOs could do is band together to increase small business development, quality employment, or home ownership in these, neighbor in these neighborhoods to move the needle on income and wealth creation by geography. Now in Chicago, a group of CEOs recently formed the corporate coalition to reduce the severe economic inequalities in the Chicago region, including investments in key neighborhoods to build wealth. This group formed prior to the murder of George Floyd, but the recent racial reckoning has accelerated their efforts. Chicago, as you may know, is a headquarters town and, and so their headquarter, their coalition reflects that. It includes headquarters like Hyatt, McDonald's, Boeing, Exelon that are part of this coalition. What I like about their effort is their explicit commitment to reducing inequities through their core business operations. So they say that their strategies are around their own talent acquisition, employee advancement, supply chain, and site location strategies. These are the three activities of the corporate coalition with two of the efforts, the second and third one, focused specifically on improving opportunities on the south and west side of Chicago, which is their historically disadvantaged neighborhoods. So what you see on the left is one, they are prioritizing early initiatives on adopting trauma sensitive practices within their companies. Second, they are increasing food services procurement with vendors located on the south and west side of Chicago. And three, they are making catalytic investments in community transformation on the south and west side in partnership with key neighborhood groups and philanthropy. So I wanna close this section by noting that in the past year, a number of regional CEO groups have actually formed to tackle racial equity together. This includes the Minnesota Business Coalition for Racial Equity, the Washington Employers for Racial Equity, the Business Equity for Indy, the Corporate Coalition of Chicago. Each of these organizations are devising strategies to move the needle meaningfully in their own communities which to me matters because it is in cities, it is in metropolitan areas like Dallas where opportunity is found and where opportunity is created. So lastly, the thing that CEOs can also do is influence, uh, use their influence as board members of chambers, of economic development groups or other public private partnership groups to ensure that the staffs of these powerful economic shaping civic organizations are doing their part to advance racial equity and economic competitiveness. Now, in Indianapolis, the Indy Chamber is an example of a holistic approach. With the support of its board, the Chamber has adopted an inclusive economic growth strategy in which the values of DEI is embedded across their entire economic development program, not as a separate siloed activity. For instance, they have launched an inclusive incentives program, which rewards um, firms that create jobs that pay at least $18 an hour, which is for them their living wage, they have to offer benefits and they have, these companies have to invest in programs 
that remove barriers for local workers to access those good jobs, investments in workforce, childcare, transit. They also have a partnership with the Department of Corrections to help returning citizens launch new businesses, bringing their entrepreneurship services program to new workers with good ideas. And third, they have been serving as the CDFI during the pandemic, helping small businesses overlooked by traditional banks to access loans and technical services, thereby improving capital access for many women and minority owned businesses. Or what CEOs can do is encourage their chambers to build the capacity to execute one critical strategy for the region, say on supplier diversity, if that is something you wanna work on. And in this case, the Cincinnati Chamber houses one of the most promising and effective minority business accelerators in the country. What is unique about this program is that it targets promising black and brown owned firms with at least $1 million in revenue. This program therefore tailors services to this portfolio companies that are already scalable and it therefore increasing their chance for quality job creation, their chance for wealth building for black and Latino entrepreneurs, and for even more firms to build vendor pipeline relationships with the larger incumbent firms. And to date, Cincinnati's program has supported 67 minority owned businesses that have generated $1.5 billion in aggregate annual income. So I just wanna close with this quote from Melody Hobson, who is the founder of Ariel Investments, who was recently appointed the chair of the board of Starbucks. She said this, this is corporate America's moment. She called this period the civil rights 3.0 in which this phase now fair, squares falls squarely on the feet of corporate America. The first two phases of the civil rights movement was emancipation and the 1960s Civil Rights Voting Rights Act, where government was in the lead. But now the fight for racial equality is a corporate responsibility. To make the economy we work for more people, the titans of industry that shape the economy must now ensuring, ensure that their hiring, their investments, their business practices, their economic policies expand income and wealth for more express America, for more Americans, especially Black and Latino Americans. And doing so is not just good for the economy, it's also now critical for the business bottom line. So this moment is truly yours. And I hope you seize this moment as CEOs to move from commitment to action so that more Black and Latino workers and entrepreneurs and community members are at the heart of your thriving, inclusive post-COVID economy. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Amy, for those amazing insights. Uh, I am so grateful that we have you here with us in person today. Uh, so welcome, welcome. Hi, Jared, uh, how are you? I'm great, I'm great, it's good to see you again. Now, I uh, have had a few people ask questions, and so what I wanna do uh, is just ask you, we're just gonna limit it to two questions today. Um, and so the first question, you talked about some of these newly formed coalitions uh, that are happening across cities uh, in, in the US. Are you seeing a large number of financial institutions, banks, credit unions, uh, other financial services organizations involved in these coalitions? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, they're the oftentimes the first to jump in because they're historic commitments to um, community development. And um, so they are natural partners in this, um, but they're also being joined by other major employers um, in manufacturing, in the high-end services, um, even headquarter companies um, in these coalitions. And I, like I said in the presentation, Jared, I think a lot of these commitments are moving away from community investments in philanthropy. This is really about how they join together around um, uh, hiring, board composition, procurement practices, um, and not just um, investing in small business ecosystems, but actually being partners uh, with the small business community. So I think it's exciting. I love that, love that, thank you. Um, now, now, one of the things that you talked about as being very important to moving uh, equity forward is increasing the number of black and Hispanic workers in tech roles and tech jobs. Uh, we at the DRC think that's incredibly important as well. And so we've partnered with Accenture to build out a toolkit focused on diversifying tech uh, uh, roles within our, our region. Um, 
the, one of the things that we've heard in some of our interviews is that there's not a pipeline, that, that, that people can't find the talent. What do you talk, what do you tell CEOs when, when that comes up in conversation that they just can't find the talent in the pipeline? The talent is there <laughs> and um, they're there and they're eager to participate, Jared. And I think what's so exciting, I'm glad you, that Accenture is part of the Dallas initiative because Accenture has a really wonderful um, apprenticeship program in Chicago um, where they have partnered with the community colleges and have already in a couple of years exceeded their goal of um, providing workplace learning for a thousand young people. Many of them are um, immigrants, first time college goers and their families. So I think I think it's been a win win situation for the next generation. Um, and Jared, I have to tell you, the more I dig into this research and look at uh, recent surveys is young people today are demanding working in the work in a diverse workplace. In fact, it's a really critical um, criteria for actually talent attraction and talent retention. And in fact, in this environment, I think Dallas and uh, some of your peers like Austin are attracting a lot of um, companies and workers in the post pandemic environment. And what I'm seeing and reading from polls of young people today is um, they're only going to stay in companies that are tolerant and inclusive or else they're going to leave. And so, in fact, in an environment where um, skilled digital workers have a lot of choices in the marketplace today is actually investing in a diverse workforce is how you attract and retain talent. And I also think that's why it's important not to think about this as talent attraction, but investing in your homegrown talent as part of your um, future competitiveness. And that's, again, good for your business bottom line, obviously very good for the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. I love that. Um, thank you again for being with us today. I wish we had more time, but we have uh, uh, a really tight agenda today. And so what we're going to do next is I'm going to turn it over to our SVP of Community Engagement, Tasha Heron Bruff, to lead us into our next session, our panel discussion. So Tasha, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jared. Wow, Amy, what great information. But she talked about moving from commitment to action. And now we wanna talk just about that because we have some special guests that are joining us and they're gonna talk about how do they do that. And I wanna to bring to this stage, um, we have Wells Fargo and Lyft Fund. We have Amrita P Patel. And then we also have Isaac Elizondo uh, from Lyft Fund. And we have Alyssa Tristan Nichols, who is a biz Dallas business owner. And we're so glad that you all are here uh, with us today to talk about this. So I wanna jump into the information really quickly. And so if you, I wanna start with you, Amrita. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Um, I know that you um, do a lot of work um, around uh, process management and, and driving uh, business improvements, but tell us what it is you do to help support community. Absolutely. So hi, everyone. Again, my name is Amrita Patel, as Tasha introduced me. And what I would say um, from a Wells Fargo and community engagement is um, we're really looking to combine our business expertise with our philanthropy to make sure we create stable um, and financial success for our communities. So what does that mean, right? I'm part of a 12 member public affairs council for the DFW area. And we really direct a lot of our philanthropic budgets towards the core areas that we wanna focus on as a company. And there's really four pillars there. Um, one is opening pathways to economic advancement. Um, the second, as Amy had mentioned about these coalitions, you know, creating safe and affordable housing as a bank, we can help enable that. Um, we are focused on making sure we're able to do our part in a low carbon economy. And then last but not least, what we're going to talk about today is um, empowering small businesses to grow and thrive and be resilient. Thank you. Wonderful. And Isaac, I want you, you have over 22 years of experience in management and you work for Wells Fargo in particular um, in the, on, on the, uh, I'm sorry, with Lift Fund, but really you 
as an entrepreneur, look at this from a different lens, but you've been with Lyft since 2018. Tell me a little bit about your role and how you all are working with to serve the community. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Um, yes. Yeah, so again, I'm a regional vice president uh, of micro lending here for Lyft Fund. Uh, I oversee the uh, the production, the loans that come in, and the operations within my region, which uh, covers all of North Texas, which is anywhere from uh, Lubbock all the way to Tyler, down to Waco, uh, and of course the state of Oklahoma falls within my region. Um, I could tell you uh, since we've been here since 1999 in the Dallas area, but we started uh, Lift Fund, uh, formerly Acción Texas, we started in 1994. Our mission here is to actually to provide access to capital and technical assistance to those small business owners that cannot receive loans from traditional lending institutions, uh, such as banks, uh, begin because of uh, lending banking regulations, um, such as uh, a low FICO score, or, or maybe your FICO score is perfect, but uh, you haven't been in business long enough for the banks to, to give you a loan. Uh, whatever the case, every small business owner's has a has a different background has a story and here at liftfun we we like to listen to that and uh we we really dig deep into that um at liftfun we uh we help those that are just right under the radar from banks lending capabilities uh we provide uh, the financial education and funding that that uh, that they need so that the small business owner can can work with the banks uh, it's a unique business model, uh, very different. Uh, we, we like it when we lose customers and we uh, graduate them back into the banking world uh, where they can uh, get a loan directly from the bank. And that's how we measure uh, our success. Uh, when they graduate, now we have room to help other small business owners. Uh, the small business owners pays us back and then we loan it out again. And of course, uh, uh, with the help of uh, great banking leaders in the community. Uh, again, well, I like to mention Wells Fargo has helped us through that journey and has been along with us since uh, since inception, since 1994. So uh, again, that's, that's kind of how, how we operate. Wonderful work. I want to get you in here, Alyssa. You are a personal uh, trainer. You have been for five years. You have a business in Dallas and you focus on uh, pre and post prenatal fitness. Um, but I want to I want to know from you as a business owner. Tell me about the support that you received from Wells Fargo and Lyft. Well, thank you uh, so much for having me today. I am so happy to be here and happy. I got my first loan from Lyft Fund. It was back in 2017. Um, I was really short on time in between uh, a gym that I was working at being closed and kind of the passion to open my own gym and happened upon Lyft Fund and they gave me my first loan to open my studio. Uh, I had had a, a lot of trouble with going to banks and those type of things because I didn't have any uh, business history or those type sure. of uh, situations. And so they were extremely helpful. Um, I got my funding very quickly and was still able to communicate with them after the fact. It really helped me to start my business and to kind of get my feet in the ground and uh, build roots here in Dallas. And since then has just been really helpful. I actually trained the, uh, one of my, she was my loan officer at the time. We're, so we're really good friends now. Wow. Uh, wow. And I trained her Lillian. And so everyone I can about Lift Fund because it was such a quick and easy process. Um, and they did what they could, which was something that I hadn't experienced up until that point to try and get me the max amount of money that I could and make sure that everything flowed smoothly. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you, Emery, to if, tell me why is it important to create this path of success for historically underestimated entrepreneurs? We just heard the, the, the work of Amy Liu and, and the commitment that, you know, corporations need to make to black and brown businesses. Why is this important? Why does Wells Fargo care? Yeah, so I, I would say, Tasha, the question is actually personal, right? I am a daughter of a minority-owned small business, and I am a wife of a minority-owned small business. And I think about um, the the jobs that are created in the communities we work in and um, live in, and the livelihoods that they create. And you know, when I would speak to my father when he started his business the access was so limited, not just for capital, but for tools to create a business, depending on where it is in its life cycle to sustain. And um, it was limited to friends and family, right? Hopefully someone would give you seed money or help transform your business as times were changing through this pandemic. 
And so it's just so important to make sure that it's not just capital, but the education and the tools that Isaac talked about. So from a Wells Fargo perspective, it's just great that I work for a company who has that same passion and knows that, um, you know, in addition to traditional avenues like banking, we need to find additional paths to allow small businesses and underserved communities to find the right resources to um, thrive because it is, it's the jobs in our community where we work and it's just so critical to make sure that we're part of that. Sure. I want to ask you, um, Isaac, you know, how do you all level that playing field for more small businesses? You know, I know you talked a little bit about the support that you provide, but, you know, what is it that you're actually doing that's making it possible for someone like Alyssa to actually thrive in, 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 in Dallas? Yes. Um, well, well, entrepreneurship is, again, it, it's the path to success. And um, the, the path requires mostly capital. Uh, we're providing we're providing those that need this capital. Uh, we do have a focus in the low to moderate income areas, uh, helping municipalities uh, with these opportunity zones grow in a more positive way. Uh, our loans are for everyone, uh, for anyone. And and however, uh, to level the playing field here, uh, we, we really focus in our demographics that we focus on our, our minority and women owned businesses, uh, which is are, are, are the most in need. Uh, providing these funds uh, allows to have a better footing when launching or growing your business. And and I think that's that's mostly how Live Fund really partakes in the journey with a small business owner for success. Oh, well, that's amazing. Alyssa, I'm going to give you the last word. I think you are a representation of success and a great partnership between Wells Fargo and Lyft Fund. What can you say to others about this journey and, and tell us a little bit about, you know, what you're hopeful for in your business? Um, I think I would just like to encourage uh, current business owners and minority women and men that are hoping to start a business to just keep doing your research. There are companies like Lift Fund and Wells Fargo that um, are willing to help. It's just a matter of taking the time and being consistent and not getting discouraged. You know, if you stop searching at the first no, then I would have never gotten to Lift Fund or figured out that that was even a possibility for my business. Um, and um, I just think that alone, stay in contact with Lift Fund. Lift Fund helped me out with the grant during the pandemic when you know, there was a lot of things going on, but to have already have that direct connection with them really helped. And again, it made the process super easy. So just keep your options open. Um, there are great companies like Lift Fund and Wells Fargo that are willing to help. So just keep communicating and just be hopeful because things are changing, albeit slow. It's definitely happening. <laughs> Well, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. Things are changing. I think we're on the cusp of something really great. Um, and I want to thank all of you all for being here with us today. Thank you so much. I'm going to now turn it over to our DEI Council and 2022 Board Chair Bob Pragada. Bob, thank you, Tasha. Hopefully, every uh, everybody can hear me. Uh, that was great, Amrita and Kelly and Isaac. Thank you for that great panel discussion, and thank you for all you're doing in the community. Um, my name is Bob Pergata. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of Jacobs Engineering. I also co-chair the DEI Council with Michelle Vopney and will be the 22 uh, Board Chair for the DRC. Uh, I'm really excited that we're having this conversation about moving from commitment to action and how businesses can play a role in driving equity. At Jacobs, we aim to make inclusion and diversity core to all of our business, as well as our identity embedded in all of our employment and business practices everywhere. Uh, here are a few examples of what we've done in this area. In 2019, Jacobs launched conscious inclusion training for all employees and are nearly 100% on that effort. That same year, our executive leadership team participated in the Pride Parade March in Dallas and took up top honors for the Human Rights Campaign Foundation's Corporate Equality Index naming Jacobs a best place to work for LBTQI uh, equality. Last year in 2020, we launched our global action plan for advancing justice and equity, focused on ensuring black employees have the tools they need to advance and achieve their goals. This year, we were named one of the UK Times top 50 employers for women. We have eight active employee network groups representing more than 23,000 employees globally. We know that if we're inclusive, we are more connected, and if we're diverse, we are more creative. 
that's why it was a no-brainer for us to invest in the DRC's DEI efforts and why I'm so excited to work with the DEI Council and our sub-council in all the accomplishments they've had over the past year. Uh, and I'm proud, to, I'm proud that I'll be joined by my, my colleague, uh, Jared, to describe some of the accomplishments that our sub-councils have, uh, have achieved. Jared? Thank you, Bob. So uh, we started this past year, and I'll talk about our diversity and leadership sub-council first, um, really trying to make sure that we, what one of our sub-council co-chairs, Sint Marshall, uh, describes as talk plus traction. Uh, right. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't just saying good words and putting commitments out there, but as Amy mentioned, that we were actually taking action. Um, so one of the first areas of focus was really to walk the talk while better understanding our own leadership uh, diversity. To that end, we launched the DRC's first board diversity survey, which we completed in April. Uh, another early goal was to bring together a community of DNI leaders at companies across DFW. We launched this community called DEI Leaders Connect in February with about 30 companies participating. Uh, since then, we've hosted two additional meetings and we've seen that total grow uh, up to 50 companies. Another area of focus has been infusing DEI into the DRC's leadership programs. So the Diversity and Leadership Subcouncil stepped up and created the Diversity and Leadership Scholarship. And that scholarship is awarded to Leadership Dallas applicants who come from underestimated backgrounds and might need financial assistance to participate. Um, we're also working to mitigate bias and promote e equity in the application and selection process for our leadership programs and to make sure that we're adding more DEI concepts into the curriculum. Uh, last but not least, I mentioned earlier that DRC is working with Accenture on a diversity and tech hiring toolkit and we'll be featuring sourcing, hiring, best practices, from leading employers, but also highlighting talent pipeline organizations and professional groups that are focused on tech workers. Uh, and we're extremely excited about that tool to help our businesses recruit for more diverse talent pools. We're planning to complete that in early August. Uh, so our education and workforce sub council has done a ton of work. Uh, namely, they've advocated for more employers to engage in local talent development and hiring through programs like Dallas Thrives, uh, the Mayor's Youth Employment Program, uh, Dallas Works, uh, and they are also serving as a convener for employment and talent developer roundtables for 110, which is a national coalition focused on upskilling and hiring 1 million black individuals in America over the next 10 years. Uh, the Subcouncil also worked to lead a statewide coalition of 27 business organizations to ask for clarity from the state legislature and state leadership on plans for the release of over $22 billion in federal stimulus funding for public and higher education. Now our community investment in underserved areas sub council has done uh, some amazing uh, work. One of the, the biggest or greatest efforts uh, is, is really been focused on bringing more living wage jobs to Southern Dallas County. Um, the sub-council and our, our team has worked with 17 companies to evaluate relocation and expansion opportunities in Southern Dallas County. Uh, we've also been in conversation with several members and community partners planning to bring uh, a new grocery store to Southern Dallas County. Now, the sub-council has worked with the DRC staff to build a new Southern Dallas County Economic Development Guide website. Uh, and we've really essentially built this tool from the ground up. It's a, a, an amazing opportunity or a tool to market Southern Dallas County as a premier location for business and economic opportunity. And it will be ready to launch later this summer. Last but not least, our Policing and, and Criminal Justice Policy Subcouncil ha had input on the selection of our new police chief, Eddie Garcia, and has really established a strong relationship with the new chief and his staff. Subcouncil has also made several bold statements in our legislature that just ended. Uh, we sent a letter to Governor Abbott with the signatures of 37 DRC board members advocating for more common sense police reform and increased training and accountability. Uh, we dropped a card in support of several pieces of, of uh, legislation focused on police uh, accountability uh, and community engagement. And we also sent a letter of support with signatures from 20 DRC board member companies 
to Chairman Cryer, the House author for the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, or TCOL, uh, to have a representative, uh, representative from the business uh, community on the Blue Ribbon panel. So I said a lot there. <laughs> it's amazing to look back on how we, much we've accomplished just since that this last year. Uh, and I know that we are truly just getting started. If you'd like to learn more about this work and what we're doing, you can visit our website at styleschamber.org to see our full one-year progress update. Uh, and that will also be where we have a recap of this event. Thank you.